It's your open source advocate and I'm back with another video and as promised I'm going to start off my series so I did the comparison chart for the different remote access applications and I know there's still a couple to go. I'm going to add in guacamole and I will add in tactical RMM once I get it up and running and kind of check out how it's doing. It looks like it now has some Linux support for the desktop. We'll kind of see what they've got to offer now. Tactical RMM is built on top of what we're going to cover today, which is Mesh Central. And I think Mesh Central is an absolutely terrific application. A lot of people say, well, it looks really old. And I say, so what? It is built on current standards. It is updated constantly. The guy who makes it is just absolutely terrific. If you ever go ask questions in the Mesh Central subreddit, he will, he will generally be the one who answers you if somebody else doesn't. If you ask questions over on their GitHub, the same thing. So very communicative. He is very invested and he has his own videos out there on all of the things you can do with Mesh Central. So definitely go check out his videos as well. I will link them in the description and in the show notes so that you guys can see that. And speaking of the show notes, I'm going to follow my old show notes from, from before because I really think that everything that I've got as far as installing it and getting it set up is still completely valid today. So I run it in Docker and it runs beautifully. It is super easy to update it. It is super easy to keep it up and running this way and to back it up. So I really like this method. Plus I can reverse proxy it and really just kind of do any kind of things that I want to do very simply in my opinion. Now, if you don't know much about Docker or you don't know much about virtualization and containers, then there's a place to start. And I've got videos to help you get started with that. And there's a ton of other channels that have great videos to help you get started with that as well. But in a nutshell, Docker is just a way to virtualize an application. So instead of virtualizing the entire operating system like you normally would with a VM where you're installing a full Linux virtual machine, you're really just virtualizing the application and the containerization side of that equation is saying, hey, I'm keeping it separate from other applications. It's kind of walled off in a special way. So really you're just setting up this application and a mini virtual machine and this application is running in a very efficient way. So that's really what it's about. So there's a little bit to understand about that, but I've got great tutorials on how to install Docker and Docker Compose and Nginx Proxy Manager. And I even have a script that you can go and get and run it on most Linux operating systems and it will install all of those things in one script. So it's really nice. It makes it very easy. I try to keep it up to date. I try to add a few things here and there when I have time. So that should help as well. But today we're going to cover really the use cases for Mesh Central. I consider Mesh Central to be a remote management system, a remote machine management system, an RMM if you would. I would see you using this if you're running an MSP, a managed service provider uh, kind of system. Maybe you're an IT administrator at a large business or a, or a medium sized business or even a small business and you're like, you know what, I just need to be able to reach your machines and do things on them when you're not using them so that I can keep them up to date so that I can make sure everything's running correctly so that I can make additions to security if I need to. It's really that type of system and it is absolutely great. Now, it can be used as a remote support tool and I'll kind of go through how you do that as well. It's not the best tool for that job in my opinion unless it's kind of under certain circumstances, but again, it can be used for that as well. You'll see some of the machines kind of blinking off and on. Sometimes the agent kind of goes away and then it'll pop back up and say, oh, hey, here I am. I don't know if that's just because of the way that I have things set up or if it's normal, but it does do that, but I still am able to get access to a lot of these machines and do a lot of things. And you can see I've got them kind of separated into these groups. So we'll go through all of this setup in the video and I hope that you'll enjoy it. I hope you'll get a lot out of it and I hope that I inspire you to go out and try Mesh Central because it's a really, really great tool. We're going to do that right after this. I want to say thank you to all of my subscribers and all of my patrons over at Patreon. Seriously, you guys make this so worth it for me to do these videos every week. I really truly enjoy it and I just can't say thank you enough. If you're enjoying these videos, subscribe. Let YouTube know that I'm doing a good job by subscribing to the channel. Plus, you'll get notified when I have new videos coming out. And finally, if you're enjoying what I'm doing, give it a like. Just click on that thumbs up and that way YouTube knows that you like it and they'll pass it along to other people that might enjoy my content as well. I really appreciate it. Thank you again. Let's get started. 
Okay, when we talk about Mesh Central, one of the first things to know is it's a system where you do have to log in. So I have a user with a login and I have set up two-factor authentication, which is very important. And it prompts you up here in the top corner if you haven't set that up because they know how important that is, is as well. But I use TOTP and I use that through Vault Warden or Bitwarden. Um, I love that application. It's amazing. You can always see it up here in my, in my toolbar when I'm on, on my browser because it just really makes it so easy to keep track of really strong passwords that are different for every site plus my two-factor authentication codes for every site and it syncs up with my phone it syncs up with other browsers just when i log into bitwarden i get everything across the board so it's a really great tool and i have I have videos on bitwarden and vault warden out there i highly recommend you go check that out if you're not using that as your password manager yet either but on mesh central when you really log in this is the page that you come to and this is kind of your overview page of your devices so you can see here i've got these different groups and i can just minimize these groups to kind of hide machines out of the way that i'm not worried about so these are my personal machines that i have uh, mesh central running on so you can kind of see what's going on so this is a family member's machine it's not online right now and uh, it's because it's a laptop and they close the lid i'm sure so I can hide that out of the way. Here I've got my desktops and my two servers here at the house. And then I'm going to set this up also on a couple of Windows VMs that I've set up so that you guys can kind of see how the installation goes from the client side as well. So you'll see these kind of turn off and on as they check in and out. But really, this is kind of your, your starting point. And you have some really great tools up here. So you've got this filter. So I can say, I just want to see main and look at that. So if I know the machine name, I can very quickly kind of go find that machine. It's not hard to do. If you go down, I believe you can filter, yes, to online. So you only see the online machine. So as they go offline, they'll disappear. As they come back on, they'll appear. You can say, I only want to see the offline machines, which I don't have any currently offline, but as they tinker on and off, they will. So I can go back to online. You've got some really great filters. So you can look at sessions. So right now I don't have any sessions going, which I don't see that. But if you did have people in session, so you can put in multiple users, they can log in, you can assign them access to specific groups or specific machines so that they can't have access to everything. But in those sessions, you could then see who has sessions going. If you start it, made it a favorite, it would show up under this, of course. And then if you have Intel AMT set up, which is really a Windows thing with Intel, with Intel based um, drivers, then you would see those under this section and really, um, help. So again, uh, somebody wanting help, I think is, is the idea there, uh, tagged. And then of course, untagged. And again, none of my systems are tagged. So you wouldn't see those, those things tagged, but we can go back to all, we can see all the systems at once. It's kind of up to you how you filter that down, but it does make it really nice to see that very quickly. So if you want to go by OS name, we can kind of see what's going on. So here you see that this is the entire name for the system versus just if I undo that, it's just kind of the, the name of the machine and, and it's not the full qualified domain name. So before we get into just really looking at what we can do on the systems, there are some filters over here on the upper right. So you can kind of change the layout so you can make this a little bit more minimal. You can see some details out to the right. It's a little bit more just kind of rows and then you can change it again. And you can kind of see screens from when you were previously connected. So right now it says disconnected because I'm not connected to anything. But if let's go in and let's uh, actually let's click in. And we'll connect to the desktop. And there's the background that I've got today. Pretty interesting looking. And then we'll just jump back to, to the general or to the view tab. And you can see this is what it looks like because it's still connected right now. So this is a machine that I'm act actually recording on, so I, I can't really just connect to it. But you can see what this looks like whenever we're in this mode. So there you go. Um, and then finally, we've got this view, which is very similar. It just kind of compacts it down a little bit. You can see it's a little bit more expanded. We can go back to this view and, of course, back to the main view. And here you can see whether or not it's, it's, it's on or, or off. It says well, it's the agent and it's powered right now. So we'll go back and we're going to go back here. So just an overview down the left side. And as we look, we've got kind of account settings and, and settings for the system. So really my account settings, you can see here, I've got it set up for the authenticator app and I've got my backup keys uh, ready. So everything's set there that I need. You've got your localization settings. So you can go in and tell it, you know, where are you and where should it be? And it just, I use the browser default, that works fine. Notification settings. So if you want to receive notifications about certain events happening, you can set up whether the notification has sound. You can say display device group name, device connections, 
device disconnection. So you saw that mine kind of click on and off. So I'd get a lot of notifications from that. So that's why I don't turn those on. And then AM, uh, Intel AMT desktop uh, and serial events. So you could also detect those things and get notifications about them. It's up to you if you want to turn those on or off. If they're useful to you, you might want to turn them on. So I could change my email address, change my password, um, delete my account completely or, you know, clear, uh, create a login uh, token. So I can do all these things from here, kind of on this tab. And then down here, you can see the machines that I have access to. Um, this is the groups that I have access to, and I can create new device groups from here as well. You can also do it from the other screen uh, here at, the, at these different levels. So you can do a lot of things here from this main screen. You got a lot of actions that you can take. As we go down, you can see events that are happening and you can see a, a log of those events that are going on. So this is a really nice screen for making sure that nobody's doing anything kind of weird or something's not really kind of going wrong. As you go down, you get into the files section. So from here, I could upload files from my machine and make those available to sessions when I'm on other machines. So here I would put like, I want to make these available. And then when I'm up here inside of these different machines, you see there's a files tab. So from here, I could say I need to upload some of those files or I need to download files from that machine. And that tells it kind of where I want to put those things. So you're kind of first making things of making files available. And then from the actual machine itself, you can go to the files section and say, I want to move files around and things like that. So pretty useful for you to make files available to your users as well so that you can do those transfers very quickly. Here, of course, is the user section. You can create new users and again, give them permissions to different groups, different machines, all those kind of things so that you can have multiple users within your organization and you're kind of the system admin. Finally, you can see some basic information about your server here, just different things that are going on for your server that's running Mesh Central. You can look at any kind of stats and you get some graphs and charts here. You check the console, so if there's any kind of console logs, you can go and look at that, see what's going on. And then you can do some tracing. So if you do like uh, trace, and you can kind of choose, what do you want to trace? You can look for the cookie encoder, the message dispatcher, main server messages, mesh central server uh, appearing. So all kinds of really cool things that you can do here from, from the console as well, and kind of get those console messages, just information for you to kind of check out. So this, this bottom one is really all of your server detail, pretty useful. It's very useful to know that everything here, so you can sort this by group, so you can sort it in different ways as well. Just be aware of that. But when I go into the actual machine itself, I've got a lot of capabilities. So this one has a desktop, so it gets the desktop tab. But Mesh Central is smart, so it knows this, this machine doesn't even have a desktop, so it doesn't even show me the desktop tab. I really can only go to the terminal and do things through the terminal, so that's what it gives me. And it creates an, a terminal emulator inside of the browser here for me. And I can actually do the actual things that I would want to do. So I can say apt update and it's going to run through the apt update process just like it always should. And it's going to tell me, hey, there's some upgrades available. So I could run those upgrades from here and I'm really just kind of remoted into a terminal session. It's almost like doing SSH without having to click and, and type in SSH and have SSH keys there. The agent allows me to have this connection. So I can do apt, uh, uh, let's see, this. Let's see, dist upgrade dash Y is what I prefer to do whenever it's a Proxmox. That's probably what we're supposed to do. So it's going to run through the upgrade process. I can disconnect. Uh, I believe this is still going to run, but it might be good to keep it connected just in case. While that's running, there's a few things to notice down here. Down here, we've got the control C button. So this would actually send the control C command over to the machine. You've got the control X as well, and then the escape. So you can click these to send that over to the machine instead of trying to use the hotkeys. Over here, you have control and all of these different keys. So you can kind of just say, oh, I need to send this one and, and click and highlight to get to that. And then of course, once you've selected the one that you want to send, you would click on the send button and that would send that control key over to the machine. So if I was to click on control C right now, it would stop this process. Of course, I don't want to do that. I'd rather let it finish up. It looks like it's setting up a new kernel for me on the server, which is never a bad thing. So once that's done, of course, I'll want to reboot that server. Now, that server takes a little while to reboot because it's a Proxmox server. It's actually a, a literal Dell server, so it's, it's not a fast reboot process. Uh, and it's pretty loud, so I'm not going to do that yet, but I'll know to go do that after the video's done. So I can just disconnect now from that terminal session and I'm, I'm done. Again, files, you can go and transfer files back and forth by using this uh, window here. 
We can see the events that have been happening on this particular server. We can see some details about the server and if you're somebody who's in charge of managing different machines and devices or if you're taking control to manage somebody else's devices as an MSP, then a lot of times this kind of detail is very useful. For a lot of people it's, it's not. You can just log into the machine and see the information, but if you're not there physically, sometimes checking this stuff is really useful for troubleshooting, trying to figure out like what's going on, why, why am I suddenly not you know, seeing what I expect with this machine or this server or this device. And then finally, again, the console. So you can come here and kind of check out what's going on with the console. If there's any console information happening, you'll see that here. So when we come back to here, I want to talk about this general tab because you do get some information about this uh, machine. And again, it says this is the host name. This is because I'm getting into it through my reverse proxy and this is where my reverse proxy runs. This is really not the host name of the machine. Um, so I don't know why it just kind of pulls this somehow and defaults it to this to this number, um, it's not correct. This is not even the IP address of this machine, in fact. So you can edit this if you want to, and I could change it to the actual host name of the machine. Um, I don't know why the OS name uh, is, is different there, but we could actually change this to the OS, to the host name, and save it, and there you go. We can put in a description for it as well um, if we want to give it a description. So this is my proxmox main server. Just like that and then we cannot click this as you know as you notice there's no no option to, to change that um, the group that it's in we could change if we want to but this is my home server so that's a good group for it it tells us that it's Linux 64-bit it's Debian GNU Linux 11 which it is that's correct and then of course we could look for user consent so this is the part where I said you can set up Mesh Central to work a little bit like a remote support system. So your your user might send you a message, email, whatever, say, hey, I'm having a hard time with this, and this could be a desktop, it could be whatever. I really need your help. So you could put in here like, hey, when I when I log in, I want to notify my end user that I'm logging on the machine so that they know that I'm I'm trying to work on it. You can also say, you know, prompt the user for consent, like I want to log onto your machine, but you need to say OK or it's not going to do it. So until they click the OK button, you won't be able to get on. And then you've got this last one, which is show the connection toolbar, which shows that on the user's machine as well. So you can check all of these options. The reason I say this is a little bit, this isn't exactly like a remote support tool is I believe a remote support tool should 100% give the power to the end user to kick you off of their machine. I don't think there should be any way for you as a person providing remote support to override that because if they see you doing something they don't want you doing, they should absolutely be able to kick you off of their machine and not let you back on. This just says, hey, I want this to work this way, but if they're not letting you on for some reason, all you got to do as an admin is come in here and open this up and then uncheck the boxes. Now, if you're a person who has a business and you're wanting your end users, your 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 IT personnel to have these things set. You go in and set these as an admin and they can't go change these things if they don't have those admin privileges that if you don't give it to them. So there is some setup there. There is some things that kind of happen, but it's really you initiating, hey, I need to connect and the user going, okay, let me let you connect. So like I say, it's kind of that that type of system, but because you have the ability to override it, I feel like it's a little bit of a, there, there's an easy workaround for somebody who wants to do something that they shouldn't be doing. Um, again, terminal, notify the user, prompt for consent. So you get all these different things that, that you then have to kind of, you know, have your users or your, your IT administrators work with the user to get things done. Um, and then finally files, you can do the same thing. So I like this feature. For me, it's not useful because I, I don't want to have to ask myself if I can log into my own machines, but you understand what I'm saying. Um, notifications, so you can set up notifications as well. So for the device connections, device disconnections for this specific device, you could say, yes, I want to know when that happens. Um, again, it could be very spammy, just depending on how often it connects or disconnects. And finally, tags. So you notice I didn't have any tags earlier. So I'm going to put this under Proxmox, and I'll say OK. And now I have a tag called Proxmox. Once we move down, we've got Actions. When you click on Actions, you kind of get this list of, I can wake up this machine. If it has wake on LAN set up, uh, it should be able to do this. I can run commands on this machine. I can make this machine sleep if it has that capability. I can reset the machine to kind of make it try to, you know, reset itself. 
I can power off the machine, and then of course I can uninstall the agent remotely from here. I can say, you know what, I don't need to manage this machine anymore. I'm going to uninstall this agent so that it, it goes away and it'll remove it from our interface and everything like that. So you have a few things. So if we click on run commands, click OK, it's going to say what commands do you want to run. So instead of going into the terminal and remoting in, I can tell it, you know what, run these commands from here, and that's what I want to do. So I can say run as the agent, run as the user, agent if no user, and then finally must run as user. So I can kind of set how I want these things to be run, type in what I want to run, hit OK, and it's going to send those commands. So let's just do this apt update and hit OK. Yeah, so it's trying to run it. I don't know if it's going to refresh for us or not. but So it's giving us a little bit of feedback that it is trying to run that command. Um, takes just a minute for it to run. There we go. Now we're getting some things to kind of finish out. And you can see it's building out kind of what it did. So you can see that in the console whenever you do that. But you're running the command remotely. It's, it's It runs. It's sent it. It's doing it. It's not something where I have to stay looking at this logged in terminal. I can run it from here. So really great that, I, that you have that capability. Um, if we go back to actions again. Again, you see all of these actions that we've got. So a lot of things that you can do from this control panel without ever even looking at the screen of the of the machine. You can add notes about the machine. So maybe you want to say, um, make sure not to shut down this machine for reboots during normal hours of business operation. Maybe this is this is a production machine. You don't want it to be shut down. So now I've said this note. If I, if I come in as, a, as another administrator and click on this, I'll see this note and then I'll know, okay, I don't want to shut this thing down. So you've got logging events, so you can log different events that you're doing or things that are happening. Run, so again, you have kind of some options here and we want the command shell to be Linux BSD, uh, run as user agent, uh, you know, so you can say run as agent and then command. So this kind of has the same thing as the actions and commands. We just got to it from a different way. We've got message. So display a message box in the remote system. So I want to send a message to the user that says, hey, this machine is going to be shut down and for a few minutes. Uh, and, you know, we're going to reboot it for updates or something like that. You could send that message or, hey, server's going down in a few minutes. You'll probably get disconnected from it. Who knows, right? Whatever you want to send, you can do that from here, which is pretty great. Now, this is to one, one device. This is not to all the devices. You can chat with the end user and you see it opens up a chat window so I can go and type in chat information and then send that to them and they'll they'll see that chat information so you get a ton of capabilities from right here in this terminal now as we go down we can look at interfaces so we can see different in interface information what's going on with the machine so again the 17 is not a correct information um, it's pulling that from the proxy so you do web VNC it's gonna try to connect but it can't I'm pretty sure yeah, so it doesn't have any way to connect because I don't have a VNC server running on this machine. Uh, user authorizations, again, so I can add users who are allowed to do things with this machine or remove users who I don't want to do things with this machine. So tons and tons of capabilities inside of this system. We've talked about the terminal, files, everything like that. So that's a, that's a system without a desktop. So before I continue, I'm going to go and show you how to add Mesh Central to another machine, to a remote machine. All right, when I want to add a new system, I go to the group that I want to add it to. So in this case, it's going to be my home desktops, and I'm going to go to either add an agent or invite. Now, if you do add an agent, it's going to give you this window where you're going to pick what type of operating system is it, and then how do you want to access the machine? Background and interactive, background only, or interactive only. So it's kind of up to you how you do that, but depending on what you pick, when you click here, you'll download those files. Now, in this case, I'm going to do this through the invite. So I'm going to say invite, and I'm going to say one hour um, is how long this inv invitation is good for. And then all available agents. So it just depends. Now, if I know I'm sending somebody that's a, that's a Windows machine, I can just say I'm going to send it to Windows. And then background interactive, background only, or interactive only. So um, we can kind of set it either way, but let's just do interactive only and see what that does. And then here's the invitation link. So I'm just going to copy that link. I'm going to click OK, and I'm going to go to my email, and I'll just put in my current email address. I'm sending it to myself. And mesh central invite for help. And here is the email, and here's the link. So I'm going to click. So I'm inside of a Windows 11 virtual machine right now. 
So when I click on that, it kind of tells me, okay, remote mesh agent install for home desktops. And it says download the software here. So here's the, the link. So I'll zoom this up a little bit, make it a little easier to see. And it's kind of telling you here's what you need to do. So click install, allow remote control for a limited time. So kind of easy. So this is where you kind of get into, this could be a support tool. You want to make sure you're on 64 bit. If it's a 64 bit machine, if it's 32 bit, make sure they, they change to that tab. So again, you might have to walk your user through a little bit of this, but we're going to click on that. We see that it downloaded already. We're just going to click. And here comes the installer and it says windows protected your PC. If they click on that more info, they get this thing that says run anyway. So they told us what to do. We're going to say connect. We're going to say yes. It's going to open this up. It's going to run a little bit of stuff there. So now let's go back to our mesh central. And here we see our new windows 11 VM. So I can click on this and I can say desktop connect. And it says active RDP isn't because I'm using RDP to get to it right now. Um, so what I want to do, so I want to click on it and say, yes, I want to see that active RDP session. And now I'm inside of my windows 11 machine and I can go full screen just like I did. And I've got control over the machine just like that. So I'm going to escape out of this. I'm going to switch back to my RDP session here. You can see that I can still see the screen. So it didn't kick me out. It just joined the message central user into it. I can take this and move it back as the user. And if I go back to Mesh Central, you'll see that it's right back. And if I move it here and I switch back to my RDP session, it's over here. So it's a really nice way to do this. Now, when I'm tired of that person being on my machine, I can disconnect them. And now I'm no longer connected and you see it doesn't even show up in my machine's list. So if they want help again, I have to go back and run that invite process again. So there's the first way that you can run this system kind of from the end user's perspective. Now the other option is add the agent. So again, we're going to go to Windows. We're going to say, hey, I want to get this thing. And this says copy the Windows 32 bit or the Windows 64 bit. And I'm going to say background and interactive. There we go. So we've got the, the screen up and you can see I can even do this from the sign in screen. It's not even signed in yet. Now I want to disconnect and there's this RDP connect. So when you do this, it wants to know what's the domain, what's the username, what's the password, and then remember the credentials. So the domain I don't have, but we're going to put in Brian and my password for that machine. We're going to click OK. So here we got logged in. It's logged in through RDP. So we can kind of see how that's working. And again, this is just RDP through the browser. So it's working pretty well, but if we just disconnect, we can just connect without the RDP and it does pretty well. We just have to log in from this particular standpoint. So a little different, but you do the same exact thing. And again, if you want to uh, maximize, you can click this button, but if you just click it, it only takes up the browser space. But if we disconnect and then reconnect, if we shift, if we hold the shift key and click this button, you see it goes full screen for us, which makes it a little bit better experience overall. Now, one more thing I want to look at is we're going to go to uh, back to here. We're going to click on it. We're going to go to the general section. Now, remember down here we had Web RDP. So I'm going to click on Web RDP. And again, it's going to show us something a little bit different, but you can see that it's got the domain. So we're not going to type that in, but I'll type in this and my password. And again, you can tell it to remember you if you want it to, but I'm going to say connect. And you can see, again, we get in through WebRDP. It does a lot of things to make it a little bit faster experience for us. But if I click on this, you can see it, it kind of creates the page, builds the page. It's a little weird how it builds that menu downward. Um, if we click here, we can open this up. You see how it kind of builds the page over time. It's a little bit odd to me that, we, that, that it does that. But there's your WebRDP if you want to see that kind of setup as well. So we can just go here and close that to disconnect from it. And if we go back, so if we look at that versus this kind of setup, let's just do this. Let's log in. 
And now if we look, look at how much faster that is and it even kind of builds upwards like it's supposed to. So for me, this is a much speedier connection than the WebRDP, uh, just personally. Again, if I, if I click here, it looks more like it comes out of the screen towards us and we can drag it around. There's still gonna be lag. I mean, it's, it's a remote session. It's not meant for playing games. It's meant for supporting the, the actual device itself. But there you go, some pretty great tools. And if we look along the bottom, we've got Send, Control, Alt, Delete. And then of course, once you've selected what things you want, you've got all of these different kind of things that you wanna send. So we can say Win, Send, and that opens up the Windows menu. So you can see it sends the hotkeys for you. You've got Escape. You've got clipboard options, so you can actually add things to the clipboard and pass them over from your main machine to the machine that you're working on. So if you have some kind of block where you want to type in a bunch of stuff and then hit, then send it over to wherever you're trying to fill it in, this is the thing to use. It's called type. It opens up this box and I type in all of these things. So I'm going to just type in Internet Explorer. Why would you do that? But hey, why not? Um, and if I spell it correctly, it'll even help more. And I'm going to say OK. So it sends it over to the field on the background. Of course, I can just type and send it to the field, but there is a different way to do it. If for some reason you can't seem to get input into a place on the, on the screen, you can always try the type box and see if that works. We can just get rid of that thing. Over here in the bottom right, you've got these really nice tools. So if we click on tools, look at all of these things that we have. Here you can see all the services that are actually running on the system. So pretty great information that you can get out of the system here. You can also share this device with a guest. So if you're connected and you want somebody else to jump on and help you, you've got that option with the share icon here in the bottom right. So if you feel like the desktop is frozen, if for some reason things didn't seem like they were updating, you can always click on this button to refresh the desktop as well. You can download the remote clipboard contents. Uh, so if you wanted to see kind of what's on the remote clipboard or kind of try it on your own machine locally, you can download it through this. You can record the remote desktop. So you can record this session and kind of see, because a lot of times when you're doing troubleshooting, especially for software developers, they want to see what's happening. So being able to connect and then remote in and, and record that session and provide that to them, it's super useful. It's a really, really great tool. So a lot of really great tools just around the border of the screen here. I mean, Mesh Central is a powerful, powerful tool. It's an amazing tool for keeping things up to date and doing the things you need to do. One of the things that I do most often is just go in and say updates, especially on Windows. And I'm really looking for Windows update settings. I want to do like check for updates. There's usually an option for that, but I don't see it here, but that's fine. We can go and we can say, let's go to settings. I'm sure they have updates in here somewhere. Yeah, so right here we can say check for updates, and you can see right here there's a cumulative update for Windows 11 version that, and it's like download and install. I click that. I can disconnect from this thing now and go do my business while Windows runs its update. You know, some of the updates are fast, but some of them take like 45 minutes for some reason. So you've got a lot of really great options for things that you can do here. I'm just going to close that. I've already kicked it off. I can disconnect, and I'm back to here. Now, if you want the terminal, you can still do the terminal for Windows as well. So DIR, there we go. So you can run all the things you, you normally would just like we did before. And then you can disconnect files, everything just like from the other system. Just amazing that we can even do these things, but it's really great. Oh, there's our command where we ran the DIR from the remote console a while ago. So you get all of this information through Mesh Central and you get this really great ability to kind of group these machines, give access to other users, and really just provide them with all of the tools that they need in order to do their jobs. So I, I love Mesh Central. I think it's a terrific tool. I think it's great, great things going on with it. And I'm always excited to see all the updates that they're coming out with. Now I'm sure you want to know, okay, how do I install this and get it running? Because if you're excited about it like me, you want to know how do I run this myself? It's great to watch somebody else do something and see how it works, but I'm hoping that I've intrigued you and, and we're ready to kind of go run this thing. So I'm going to follow my instructions that are out here already on the site. And it's just the same ones that I've used in the past, but really we're going to install Docker CE, Docker Compose, and Nginx Proxy Manager, which I already have installed, but I have a tutorial on how to do that. We're going to install Mesh Central, and we're basically going to use Docker Compose, and here's the file. There's just a few little things that you need to know, and I try to walk you through it step by step so that you know exactly how to get this set up. Because it's really great to run it locally just for your own machines around your house, but it's awesome to be able to run it with the internet exposed and people being able to are you being able to access other people's stuff and their agents being able to check into your server so that you can get that set up? 
All right, I've got a fresh system set up here. This is a Ubuntu 22.04 system. Now, if you already have Docker CE and Docker Compose installed and you don't need to do this part, feel free to skip ahead in the video. I'll have timestamp down in the description. Out here on GitLab, I've got this project and I'll have a link in the description and in the show notes, I have exactly how to go get this file. But I've got this thing called Docker installs. You go down to this one that has the SH, the bash uh, shell script here. And you jump over to raw and you can just highlight and copy this uh, URL right here. We'll go back to our terminal and I'm gonna do wget and I'm just gonna paste in that URL. It's gonna go grab that script. And if we do an LS, we can see that script now. So if we do chmod plus X and then the name of that script, we're just gonna change that to an executable. So by default, the script is not executable and we want it to be executable so we can run it. So now we're gonna run it, we're gonna do dot slash. This means run this thing that's in this current place. And we're just gonna start typing and hit tab. That'll finish it out for us. And we're gonna let it run. So I try to go grab some information about your system, kind of check it, see if you feel like it's correct. If you think so, then that tells you kind of where to click on or which number to put in down here. So you've got your CentOS and Fedoras on number one. You've got your Debian's on number two. You've got Ubuntu 1804 on number three. And then you've got several other Ubuntu's up here for number four. You've got Arch for five, six is OpenSUSE. And if you just want to exit the installer, press seven. So I'm on Ubuntu 2004 in this case. I'm going to hit four. It's going to ask me for my super user password. So you should not be doing this as root. You should be doing this as, as a user who has pseudo privileges. And it's going to ask, do you want to install Docker CE? So I'm going to put Y. Yes, I do. And Docker Compose. Again, I'm going to answer with a Y for yes. Nginx Proxy Manager, I already have installed on my network and I can use that one. So I'm not going to install it. But if you don't have Nginx Proxy Manager and you want to proxy traffic from outside the internet to your mesh central system, then you may want this. I have videos on how to set this up and how to do it out there, but I'm going to say no. Uh, and then Navidrome, I don't need and uh, don't need Portainer in my case. If you haven't used Portainer and you'd like it, go ahead and hit Y. That's fine. So once I hit those, it's going to go out and it's going to try to upgrade the system or update the system. Now I ran the updates already just to make this a little bit faster. So you'll see then it jumps up and it's going to do a prerequisite installation for those packages that we need that are prereqs. So I just tell you as, as I go along, I kind of hide all the text in the background so it's just not scrolling up your screen faster than you can read it. It's now going to install Docker CE, the community edition. And when it finishes installing that, it'll tell us what version that is. All right, once it finishes that, you'll see the, the version there and then it'll start installing Docker Compose for us. And it's pretty quick, it doesn't take very long to do Docker Compose. All right, now that we've got Docker and Docker Compose installed, we wanna create our folder structure. So we're gonna do make directory dash P docker slash mesh central. And what this command does is it says, make the directory Docker, and then inside of that, make the directory mesh central. But if this directory exists, it's, it tells it don't make it, just go ahead and create this one inside of it. So we're not creating duplicate directories or anything like that. That's, that's what the dash P is there for. So we'll do that. We get our, we'll get our folders. We're gonna do CD Docker uh, slash mesh central. There we go. And inside of this empty folder, we're gonna say nano. Uh, docker-compose.yaml and in here we need to go paste the docker-compose.yaml code that I have out there in my write-up. So out here in my write-up we just go copy this code and we're just going to go back to our terminal. We're going to do control shift and V like Victor and that will paste it all in. We can scroll up to the top here and double check everything. So there's a few things we need to change. So as we go down we want to leave everything up to here alone. Now this specific port forwarding is what I use. So I, I forward 8086 to 443. Now, if you're not using Nginx Proxy Manager, you can use 443 to 443. If you want to use some other one, it's fine. It's up to you. Just don't try to use port 80 because it will, Mesh Central will kind of gripe about that because that's not a secure port and you don't want to use that. But in my case, I said 8086 and it's 443 and it seems to work just fine. I've had no issues with it, so just understand you can change the left side of this port mapping to any port you want. Just don't change the right side. It needs to stay 443. And the environment variables on the host name. So we want this to be the host name that we're going to use. So I'm going to change this to uh, meshtest.routemehome.org. Now, I own the domain routemehome.org. 
I have a wild card subdomain, so asterisk.routemehome.org, like the literal asterisk on, on you know, on the, on the star symbol, and that points to my home IP address. So anything that I create .routemehome.org goes to my home IP address, and then Nginx gets that request and has to handle it. And most of the time, you'll just get a congratulations if you type in something that doesn't exist. Otherwise, it'll try to route you to the right thing. So if you're going to use a subdomain, you need to have a domain that you own, and you need to make sure that that is pointed to your IP address of your public IP address, wherever your server is at. So make sure you've got that set up. The next thing is if you're behind a reverse proxy, which you should be, um, you're going to set this up. So I, I need to change this to the correct information. Uh, for my reverse proxy IP address, you should do the same thing. So if you use 172.20.0.7, you should change it to that. Uh, I'll change this to mine. On the TLS port, you want to leave this as 443. Um, so iframe faults, I leave this set to faults. It, it's just up to you. If you want to like try to use this in an iframe somewhere, you can change it to true if you want to. Um, allow new accounts I also leave this as false because once I'm signed up as the admin I don't want other people to be able to sign up on my instance if you are a business and you're gonna let your internal employees sign up you might want to leave that as true and once everybody signed up turn it off that kind of thing you can always create users from inside the system WebRTC, I would leave this as true this is very useful and it makes things run a lot faster and then your time zone mine is America Chicago you should change this time zone value to whatever you need Finally, on the volume mappings, we have dot slash mesh, mesh central slash data. So the dot slash means in the folder where this docker compose.yaml file exists, I want there to be a mesh central folder with a data folder inside of it, and that's going to map to something in the container that's opt slash mesh central slash mesh central data. Same thing for the second one. It's going to be inside of the folder where the docker compose.yaml file is at dot slash. I want a mesh central folder, which is this one up here, same one. And I want there to be a user file section, and that's going to map to the container on opt slash mesh central slash mesh central files. You can leave this as it is. You can change it. It's completely up to you how you do this. Um, I like to do it this way and just have one level because I've already got the mesh central folder, so I don't need it duplicated. So I'm just going to back this out. So it's just dot slash data and dot slash user files. Up to you 100%. Just kind of do it how you want. Now, up above... We've got restart always already set. We're going to call it mesh central and we've got the image already set. So everything else should be good. Once you've made those changes, you're going to do control O and then enter and then control X to exit out of nano. All that's really left is for us to run this. So we're going to do docker hyphen compose up dash D and then two ampersands docker hyphen compose logs dash F. And then it should give you some output like this where it says, hey, I'm starting to run everything for Docker. Um, I'm starting to run everything for Mesh Central. You should see this coming up. It's going to get to this point. It's going to tell you like, okay, here's your proxy. Here's the, the, the server that you've set up that you wanted to have as your, as your um, URL. So once you've got that, we're going to go over to uh, Nginx Proxy Manager and make sure that that is set. So if you don't have Nginx Proxy Manager, if you use a different proxy, that's fine. But I use Nginx Proxy Manager, and what this does is it lets me set up reverse proxies into my network so that it really handles all the network traffic requests that I get. So I'm going to zoom this up. So once we get in here, we're going to hit Add. So we're going to add a new proxy, and we're going to do mesh test.routemehome.org. Make sure you type in your name correctly. Make sure everything's correct, and then hit Tab or hit Enter so you get this little chip. You see how it's kind of got a gray background there? We're going to switch this scheme, the schema here, we're going to switch to HTTPS. We're going to go to the IP address of our server, and then we're going to tab, and we're going to give it 8086 as the port. So this is the port that we just set it up with. We're going to say block common exploits, WebSocket support, and then we're going to go over here to the SSL tab, and we're going to just drop this down and say request a new SSL certificate. We want to force SSL, HTTP2 support, Make sure your email is filled in correctly and then hit I agree to let's encrypt terms of service and then click on save. That should start spinning. And if this box goes away without any red errors or anything like that popping up, it may take about 30 seconds to a minute. As long as it just goes away, you should be set. 
like that. So when it just goes away like that, we should be set. So now we should be able to open up a new tab out here. And we can go to meshtest.routemehome.org. And as you see, that forwards me right through. So it goes, in my case, I've got hair printing turned on. It goes out of my network, comes back into my network and says, oh, hey, I see where that should be. And you can see I've got a valid Let's Encrypt certificate. I didn't get any warnings in my browser about, hey, you don't have this set up. So it says, don't have an account. We're going to say click here. We're just going to go in and create our account real quick. This isn't hard. So I'm going to say, Brian, I'm going to give it my email. And I'm going to give it a strong password a couple of times here. Make sure it matches and this will turn on and we're going to say create account. Now you can tell your browser to save that if you want to. It's completely up to you. Um, I like to use Vault Warden or Bitwarden when I do that. But here you go. You are inside of your mesh central setup. Now you just need to start adding groups, creating groups, creating agents. Go through all of your setup stuff here for your account. Make sure you turn on two-factor authentication. Get your backup codes. You can set a picture for yourself if you want to. Set up all your settings. Really go through and check everything out in the system. Make sure you've got everything set the way that you like it and the way that you want it. But once you're done, you're ready, really ready to start creating those groups and adding machines with agents and getting everything set up and, and working. So it's really not hard to get Mesh Central installed. It takes very little time, very little effort, and it's really, really an awesome system. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, like, subscribe, tell your friends about it so they can come along the journey with us, and I'll talk to you next time. Oh, <laughs>